this and read that on purpose because a new year requires a new series. And I can't believe it's been 12 months since I first, I guess I started that in January, probably, uh, the basic training series. But, you know, between that and different holiday messages, lasted a whole year. And it could have lasted longer. But it's time to begin again. I've been reading a lot in the book of Proverbs lately, and I made a, a it's just sort of a realization struck me that I have never heard anybody, um, maybe I, it probably happened when I was a kid, I just don't remember. <laughs> but I don't remember ever hearing somebody preach extensively just from the book of Proverbs. Boy, there is so much here. So much good stuff. And I wanted you to benefit from Proverbs as much as I have. I'm, I'm calling this series The Way of Wisdom. Because when you read Proverbs, you hear a lot. You read a lot about wisdom and foolishness. And so we're going to begin in chapter 1. The book of Proverbs gives instruction on many topics that are in great need today. You think about financial wisdom. Friendship wisdom, work ethic, and laziness, relationships, marriage, and child and parent, love and forgiveness, interpersonal conflict at work. There is something to be mined and learned from in the book of Proverbs, no matter where you need wisdom. Y'all remember that verse from James? I think it's chapter 1 or 2, where James says, If any of you lack wisdom, <laughs> Let him ask of God. Well, if you ask for wisdom and then don't read the Bible, you're not going to receive it. Because this is where the wisdom is found. It'd be like if I, if one of my kids came to me and said, I would like a cookie. And I said, and I gave him permission. Go get the cookie. But then they just wait for me to put it in their hand. That is not how it works. You know where the cookie jar is. I know, because I saw you stealing some last night. <laughs> we have to do the work. And a lot of the work when it comes to wisdom is in the book of Proverbs. So why a series from the book of Proverbs? Well, a couple of reasons. Wisdom is uncommon. And foolishness is very common. God, if you think about it this way, God wouldn't devote an entire book, 31 chapters, to wisdom if everyone were naturally wise. We are born in foolishness and we need to receive wisdom. Another reason is that wisdom is difficult to get. You ever heard this old phrase when it comes to like winning football games or be, if it were easy, everybody would what? Everybody would do it. Or maybe it comes to making a lot of money. If it were easy, everybody would do it. Well, if being wise were easy, Everybody would be wise. But wisdom is in short supply. Foolishness, however, is free. It's all around you. You can get it for nothing. The third reason is wisdom leads to life. Foolishness leads to death. And I want, more than anything else for you this year, I want you to be on a path that leads to life. And I'm not talking just about eternal life, even though that is obviously the most important but I'm just talking about in your relationships, in your finances, in your interpersonal relationships at work, at home, with your kids. Guys, we can either have the stench of death about us or the aroma of life. And when you're on the way of wisdom, you carry with you the aroma of life. And here's the bottom line reality. Without Jesus Christ... We are foolish and devoid of wisdom. Now, you've probably known some people that were unsaved that seemed to have a lot of wisdom about them. What we're not talking about as we go through this series is what I call worldly wisdom. I'm not talking about that. But here's something else that's true. I don't know who was the first person that said this. I've heard it was Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if that's true. But there's this phrase that goes like this. All truth is whose? Is God's truth. That means if an atheist 
happens to stumble upon some truth, well, he just happened to stumble upon something that belonged to God already. He didn't discover it because he was an atheist. He just happened to stumble upon it. And it already belonged to God. Well, without Christ, no matter how smart we are, no matter how much worldly wisdom we've gleaned over the years, no matter how much truth of God we've fallen into, without Christ, we are foolish and devoid of wisdom. But because Christ loves us, we can receive wisdom. And based on just those seven verses Madison read, I want to take us to three um, truths I want you to walk away with today. And the first truth is this. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. You know, foolishness is our default starting position. Nobody is born wise. You know how when you get a smartphone, it comes with default factory settings. That's what they call them, factory settings. You ever had to wipe your phone? Maybe because it gets too clogged up, or it gets messed up, or... You lost it. You didn't know who had it. You wondered, what were they doing on it? Is the FBI going to come after me? So you wipe your phone. Well, when you wipe your phone, what does it go back to? Your default settings. What's called your factory settings. Well, do you know what your factory setting is when you're born? You're foolish as the day is long. And so um, we, if you want to look at it this way, we are the opposite of these things in verses 2 through 4. We don't know wisdom. We're foolish. We need instruction. We don't understand. We're not wise. We're not righteous. We're not fair. We don't care about equity. And if you don't believe that, come over to my house on Christmas morning and watch them unwrap their gifts. We had Natalie does a great job. I tell you, if it was just me, the children would be, their Christmas would not be magical at all. They'd just be, all right, you get this, you get this. Merry Christmas. Let's not do with all the wrapping because, boy, I, I, how many of y'all are like this? The moms are sitting there and taking pictures saying, Merry Christmas to the dad's for the trash bag. All right, put that in here. Get that wrapper in here. That's me. Because, boy, the, oh, the real living room is just the best. But little Evangelina, little Sion. And Mercy's not far behind them. They want to open every present. It doesn't matter if their name's on it. They don't care. They want to open every single one. And if we let, and they fight over the presents. Yesterday, Sion said, I wanted that. Well, sorry, Santa didn't bring it to you. Tough love. Every person's default factory setting is selfishness, rudeness, what all these, the opposite of all these things mentioned. Verses 2, 3, and 4. And when we look at our country, we can see a country of foolish people, can't we? Mm -hmm. Spending is out of control, not just on the personal level, but at the corporate level and at the governmental level. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a doomsayer. I am a half, glass half full type person. But I think this reality says that we are about to go through a period of inflation like we haven't seen in some time. And when you start printing money, that's just, that's just math. Spending is out of control. What if our governmental leaders read the book of Proverbs and heeded its instruction? You think they'd spend differently? Yes. I do. People can't make their marriages work. Divorce on the rise again. Of course, maybe the lockdowns have something to do with that and people are getting tense and not knowing how to work out their problems. But if people learn to work out their problems the way the book of Proverbs tells us, would we see more successful marriages? I think we probably would. Drug and alcohol abuse is rampant. Why? That's because people don't know how to handle their inner conflict, their anxiety, their depression, other reasons. But those are some of the big ones. What if people learn the way of wisdom? There's sexual confusion. We talked about that a couple of months ago. Even good people are born in foolishness. Y'all have all heard the word, the names of Aristotle and Plato. For all that they achieved, they were not truly wise. Our founding fathers, who were great men, and they left us a great legacy. If they did not know the true God, they were not on the way of wisdom. Why? Because foolishness 
is our factory setting. It's the way we were created. We're like children. We don't know anything. And here's the worst part. We don't know that we, we don't know anything. It's one thing to be ignorant. It's another thing not to know that you're ignorant. You can't argue with somebody that doesn't know that they're ignorant. If, you, if you're talking to somebody and they know that they don't know, you might can talk some sense into them. But it's the people that don't know and they don't even realize it. They think they're the king of the world. And that's the way little children are, isn't it? That's their factory setting. They think they know everything. Well, the Bible says that that's our factory setting. We think we know it all, but in fact, we're foolish. We need wisdom. That's number one. And number two, we must receive wisdom. It must come from outside of ourselves. It's one thing to say, you need wisdom. Some people at that point would then say, you know what? Pastor said, I need wisdom. So I am going to embark on a journey of self-discovery and wisdom. And I'm going to learn it all. We've all seen the illustrations of the people climbing the mountain, trying to get to the the uh, guru on top and ask him whatever question they have, what is the meaning of life or whatever. Guys, there's nothing we can do to draw up wisdom out of the well of our own hearts. You cannot draw water from an empty well. And there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Wisdom is something that you must receive. It comes from outside of you. And unlike some false religions that teach that you can draw up wisdom from within yourself and tap into your divine self, Christianity teaches that while you are made in the image of God, there's nothing divine in you. The divine resides in God alone. And just like a child cannot instruct themselves, we cannot instruct ourselves. Any of y'all ever read the book, The Lord of the Flies? Raise your hand if you've read Lord of the Flies. Megan, Matt, that's it? I think I'm going to do a book club. <laughs> Lord of the Flies is a story. It's kind of a hair-raising story about a ship that crashes on this island. Don't, don't correct me in the middle of the sermon if I get any details wrong. The ship crashes on and there's a bunch of kids on the ship. And somehow I know that the adults aren't on the scene. I, I think they died at the crash or they died later that night or something. But the kids end up ruling themselves. And of course, like people would do, they formed a little society. And what is one of the first things you would do? Well, you elect leaders, I guess, and they do. But kids not having any wisdom, that society devolves very quickly. And it's not a, I mean, we laugh because we think of what it would be like, but they end up committing murder, and it's terrible. It's terrible. It's a, it's a real warning to what this country could look like without the right kind of leadership. Well, what did those kids need in that scenario? They needed somebody to ride in and say, let me show you how to do it. That wisdom needed to come in from outside of themselves. And we're the same way. Wisdom, we cannot draw it up from an empty well. And what this requires on our part is humility. We not only need to recognize that we need wisdom, which is step one, but we need to recognize that only God and His Word can provide the wisdom that we need. Now let me make some applications for you as parents. So we got some parents out here. Parents, you must take an active role in imparting wisdom to your children. You cannot be passive in this regard. Our kids, those younger than us, are going to receive wisdom. I'm putting that in air quotes. They're going to receive knowledge and wisdom from somewhere. Um, it might be just from school. It might, but you know who it usually is? If we don't give it to them, it comes from their peers. And that is the definition of a Lord of the Flies situation. Now, this is one of the things that I've always been careful about in youth group at church is to make sure that there are adults that know what they're doing in charge. Because if the kids are just learning amongst themselves, then what are they learning? Who knows? 
But our, what is our default setting? Is it foolishness or wisdom? It's foolishness. So if you leave kids to fend for themselves and just figure it out, whether it's about finances, guys, I am on the reserve side of my life. I am dealing with a soldier. I don't even know how she got the loan. She can't make a car payments. And I asked her, I said, would you send me your recent bill? Maybe the church could help you, or maybe so I, I know a chaplain friend whose church could help you. She sent me her last car note. It covered two car payments and my job hit the floor. $1,430. I did the math. $716 a car payment. And then she's about 20 years old. And I thought, well, first of all, how did the car company give you this deal? When I was 20, I could not have gotten a, it was $38,000 on the loan. I could not have gotten a loan of $38,000 when I was 20 years old. Maybe they're doing it different these days. But wouldn't it have helped her? She's going to lose the car. Her credit's going to be ruined for a while. She better sell it first, right? Wouldn't it be helpful if she had an adult in her life that could say, let me show you what the book of Proverbs says about how to handle money. That would have been helpful for her, wouldn't it? Before we send our kids off to get married, wouldn't it be helpful to show them this is the kind of man you need to look for, ladies? This is the kind of woman you need to look for, men. Men, this is the kind of man you need to be for your future mate. Ladies, this is the kind of woman you need to be for your future man. Wouldn't it be helpful if we did that? Our kids are going to learn from somewhere. It best be from us. What about the rest of us? Adults. Do you know no matter how old you get, you must receive instruction from others? Now that sounds odd, but no matter how old you get, you need to be willing to receive instruction. Maybe a friend who holds you accountable. Anybody, everybody here got a friend like that? They'll just tell you like it is no matter what. We all need a friend like that, don't we? They'll just tell us, you know what? I love them, but you really screwed up back there. You need to go say you're sorry to them. We all need a friend like that. And a lot of times in marriage, that's your husband or your wife. Maybe it's a pastor or another spiritual leader. You should even be willing to receive criticism from that person who you can't stand. Now, we all have a friend like that, or an acquaintance, I guess. Maybe they're not a friend. Somebody who is always critical. We all we need to be willing to hear even them. Because God can and does use many avenues to deliver discipline when we've been walking outside of this path. Which leads me to my third point. I used that word discipline on purpose. I didn't use the word instruction or wisdom. Here's why. Number three. First, you must, you must understand you need wisdom. Number two, you must understand that wisdom comes from outside of you. You can't draw it up yourself. And number three, and lastly, we must understand what wisdom is and how we receive it. Verse 7 says that wisdom, or the beginning of it anyway, is the fear of the Lord. But what does that mean? What does it mean to fear the Lord? I want to introduce you to a concept you might be unfamiliar with a little bit, and that is how Hebrew poetry works. Hebrew poetry is not like English poetry. In English, poetry always what? Rhymes. Roses are red, violets are blue. Your feet stink and your breath does too. Okay. I just made that up on the spot. Y'all can nominate me for Nobel Laureate later. Um, with, uh, poetry rhymes in English, but in Hebrew it didn't work that way. The book of Proverbs is all poetry. And the way there was a sense of rhyming, but it wasn't in the way the words sounded, but instead the concepts delivered. So, for example, look at verse 7 alone. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now then you see a little conjunction, the word but. It connects the first clause to the second clause, but it tells us that a contrast is coming up. That is called antithetic parallelism. It rhymes, but on opposite ends of the spectrum. There's also synonymous parallelism. We, we see that a lot. Verse 20 is an example of that. You don't have to turn their map. 
but it's where the second clause reinforces or repeats the first clause. But this one, there's a difference. The first one talks about the wise person. And what does the wise person do? Well, the wise person fears the Lord. And the second clause tells us what the fool does. Now, we can understand from this that this is the opposite of wisdom. What does the fool do? This is the opposite of fearing the Lord. So, do you see how we sort of put that together? What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, you don't despise wisdom. You don't despise discipline or instruction. The fool does that. So if you want to be wise, if you want to fear the Lord, what will you do? You will receive wisdom. You will receive discipline. In fact, fools despise wisdom and instruction, but the wise cherish it. They appreciate it instruction. They appreciate and receive discipline, allowing it to change their thoughts and behavior. Um, the NIV up here uses the word discipline, and that is a very good translation. My translation here says instruction. I don't know what yours says in verse 7. Fools despise wisdom and instruction, but the word instruction means discipline. Now, when you think of discipline, do you usually think of pleasure or pain? I bet Sean can answer that question right about now. The Army disciplines new recruits severely, setting them through physical pain. What are they doing? They are training that soldier to receive instruction to do what they are told. Usually, in discipline, a measure of pain is involved, and it's almost always unpleasant. In our home, a discipline usually means you're getting a spanking. As the children get older, um, Salem, of course, doesn't receive spankings like she used to. The little ones, you know, Lena gets a spanking just about every day. <laughs> Sienna, it was maybe a little bit less than that. I remember when I was a kid, I had two younger brothers. They were close in age. And y'all know, the closer in age you are, the more you fight. At least when you're not. How does it work when you're twins? I don't know. Do they fight? Listen. They do? Okay. All right. Boy, you're born the same day. You must fight a lot. But my younger brothers fall, and a lot of times their play would turn into fighting. You know how it is. And they would get spankings every day. But that was discipline. In fact, there's a word for it, corporal discipline. And that's what the word instruction here is. Fools despise it. The wise receive it. So here's the principle. You recognize your own sins and shortcomings and how they got you where you are. In the example of the private that I talked about a moment ago, took out that huge loan that she can't pay on that car, what would it mean for her to recognize her own shortcomings, her failure? Well, the first thing it would mean is not blaming somebody else, right? Don't blame other people for your problems. We live in a culture, actually it goes all the way back to even Adam, doesn't it? That woman you gave me. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. The serpent. Nobody wants to take responsibility. Yes, it's true. The loan officer should not have signed off on her loan. That's true. 20 years old, not making any money. She must have had a cosign. That's, all, that's the one thing I can figure. But guess whose name is on the bill? It's hers. She needs to take responsibility and say, you know what? I can't make this car payment. I've got to sell it. I'll take a loss on it. I realize that. But I'm going to take responsibility. Student loans, same thing. We got a whole generation of people clamoring right now. Let's get rid of student loans. Get rid of student loans. And I agree, student loans are predatory. Student loans are too high. And I hate it for you if you signed on the dotted line and made yourself vulnerable to that. But guess who signed? You did. We got people saying, I can't stay married to this person. I don't love them anymore. Well, is that what you said on the day you got married? For better? For worse? For richer? For poor? In sickness? And in health? Till death do we part. 
take responsibility. Own up to how you have led, led to your own problems. Now, in the Christian tradition, this is very easy for us, right? Should be. What does it mean to come to Christ? Why do we even come to Christ? Because we recognize our own shortcomings to begin with. We take responsibility. We say, I can't save myself. Somebody else has to do it. So for us, the way of wisdom is paved for us already in the gospel. The second thing it means is don't resent the discipline of the Lord, but embrace it. What is the opposite? Or what does it mean to despise something? It means to hate it. You don't appreciate it. Oh, it bothers me when I see somebody receive a gift. Even if it's a little kid and you should throw them. Or not say thank you. You better say thank you. You get me behind four up at my house. You best say thank you. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 12 about the discipline of the Lord. He says, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? This is what it said. My son, do not regard the life of the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Guys, if you ever receive the discipline of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, even if it's through somebody else, it might be through the government, it might be through the police, it might be through your parents, it might be through your children, it might be through a family friend. When you receive the discipline of the Lord, remember, this is evidence that God loves me. This is proof that God loves me. We've all, I, did y'all ever hear growing up, right before you guys thinking, this will hurt me more than it hurts you. And I never believed it. Not once. I don't even know if my dad believed it when he said it. But whether, it, whether you believe it as a parent or not, you're trying to communicate something to your child. You're trying to communicate to them that I love you, and this is why I'm doing it. It doesn't have to be a spanking. It could be taking the iPhone away from mom. It could be saying you're grounded for a week. Whatever. It, it pains me to do this. And by the way, just parents, if it ever gets to the point where it brings you pleasure to punish your children, you're doing it wrong. You should not. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Jesus loves us. And that's why he provides discipline for us. And wisdom is learning from that discipline. You know, it, it always pains me when I have to discipline one of my children. And then they immediately go back to doing this, exactly what I disciplined them for. That shows, now when they're real little, it might just mean their memory's bad. Like lean. I think she really does just forget sometimes. I mean, she, she probably forgets what I was paying for during the spank. But the older they get, they know. They know. They can't fool me. And when you get disciplined for getting out of bed after lights out, or for getting into the cookie jar before dinner time, or hitting your brother or sister, or saying ugly words to your brother or sister, whatever it is, and then you go back immediately to that thing, like five minutes later, oh boy, what does that tell daddy? You did not receive the instruction. You did not cherish the discipline. But a child, listen, the opposite is also true child who receives the instruction and learns from it. And you see the growth in them. That'll make your heart well up with pride. But they are, they're, they're trying. They're doing it. It's not perfect. But they're trying. And if that sounds a lot to you like believing the gospel, then you are listening well. Trusting Christ, that is believing the gospel, becoming a Christian, having your sins forgiven, requires first admitting that you're a sinner. That salvation comes from outside of me. And that I must learn from the gospel and change my ways. Repent. Sounding familiar? So the way of wisdom. The way of wisdom begins with the same steps. I need it. I don't have it. My factory settings are foolishness. And I need wisdom from outside of me. God, give it to me. <coughs> so without Christ, we are foolish and devoid of wisdom. But because Christ loves us, you can receive wisdom. So how do you do it? Well, that's what this series is going to be about. But the first step is to receive Christ. 
That's what Christmas time is about, right? Without Christ, there is no wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, there is no beginning to knowledge. So would you fear the Lord today? Would you receive instruction? And let me ask you this, if you're already a Christian, are you on the way of wisdom or the path of foolishness? There are some diagnostic questions you can ask yourself. When you receive criticism, what is your response? I'm not saying it's easy, but when somebody criticizes you, how do you take it? If your first and, and only response is defensiveness, then you're not on the way of wisdom. I can say that definitively. We should be willing to listen to criticism. Pastors, too. Do you practice self-reflection on how you can be better and more like Christ? And finally, are you comparing yourself to Jesus or to other people? We can all make ourselves look wiser if we just compare ourselves to somebody who's foolish. But that's not the standard. The standard is Christ. And that's where we need to go for wisdom. Shall we pray? Father, I pray that today and this year,